if uh, if any of you know if you can pop that in the chat function we'll talk a little bit about that more later um, and also on functionality it might help for you to know that there's a choice of gallery or speaker view uh, and you know speaker view will just show whoever's speaking and gallery view will show images of you know um, some of the people who are who are on the call so you can choose what you would like to what you would like to see um, and while you're all thinking about the link, um, so Jock Gardner there is on the ball as ever, has absolutely got it in a nutshell. So we'll talk about Alistair McKenzie and Ian McDonald as well. Um, we'll talk about Alistair McKenzie, I think, uh, as we go through the, the evening. Okay, we're uh, about to go. And the, the first thing we're going to do is, um, Richie, you can't see it, but Richie has his replica trophy from the, the winning the US Amateur with him so perhaps Richie you can let us see the trophy and tell us a little bit about the history and talk us through some of the great names that you joined when you when you won and you're on mute if you don't know. Uh, yeah Gordon thanks very much for having me first of all um, and to everybody thanks for for signing uh, in a little bit different times but um, I think the, the zoom the zoom chats work quite well. Um, yeah very fortunate to to obviously win the US Amateur, I've got the trophy here. Um, it's something that you're afforded is a chance to actually buy the trophy. Uh, there's one at Rotherdean Golf Club and uh, I also have this, which is kind of my personal copy, which I just keep. It sits in the living room and it's a great thing to look at uh, every day. And sometimes you forget maybe about the names on it. Um, I'll run through a few of them. Um, well, probably the, the most famous one you'll hear about it a lot this week is in 1930, is that the Grand Slam of golf was a bit different and, uh, and Bobby Jones won the US Amateur at Merion um, and that created the Grand Slam. Jones would go on to, to create Augusta, Augusta uh, National Golf Club in the, in the years following that. Um, Jack Nicholas is on there in uh, 1959. Jack, Jack Nicholas is on there again in 1961. Um, he, of course, regards the US amateur as, as a major. Um, following through, a, a lot of names you would know, probably Lanny Watkins, Bruce Fleischer in the, in the, the late 60s. Um, Craig Stadler, 73. Obviously, Stadler being a Masters champion as well. John Cook, Mark O'Meara. Uh, Mark Romina winning the Masters, obviously, in, I think, 99. Uh, Hal Sutton, 1980. Um, Scott Verplank, Billy Mayfair. Um, and then you get some really cool ones for me, which is uh, Phil Mickelson in 1990. Um, and the only person to ever win it three times is Tiger. Um 1984, 1985, 1986, and then Kutcher. Um, and obviously, in, in, in the last few years, um, Bryson DeChambeau has won it. So it's a, it's a really cool trophy. It's got a long history. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate to have it and, and have one that I can see every day. Excellent. That was great to see that. And one of the things I found when I talked to you yesterday, Richie, was uh, you're not gifted the trophy. How does that work? No, um, you have to you have to buy one, and it's not overly cheap. And we did discuss like being an Aberdonian and dipping into your pocket. <laughs> I sometimes get like getting blood out of stone, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, I'm not a big sort of material person. Um, I try and invest in myself and invest in what's around me, but but. Um, the opportunity to buy that was was too great and just to have it it's such a cool thing and and hopefully you know it'll be something that i'll be able to pass down to olivia and she can she can hold on to and and, and keep passing it down generations and something that is is very unique and uh, i'm very honored to have my name on it and we've just been asked do you, do you add to the engraving every year with the each new champion uh, i haven't yet but the person who actually makes it uh, is in Britain so I would wait for I need to the last one I have on there I think it's just myself is in 06 so we need a little bit of an update 
So it's running, it's running out of a little bit of a space. So we might need to add another another layer on the bottom. So um, yeah, I think I'll get that updated. Um, and uh, and just a, just yeah, just a really cool cool thing to have um, have in the house. That'll probably be another ten thousand dollars for the next layer. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Um, and uh, do you have any particular fond memories of uh, winning the US Master? If I remember right, you met your wife Angela at Hazel Team. Yeah, I met, I met my wife that week. Um, sort of story was that I, I advanced into the match play, and I'm sure everybody that's on this call, call knows match play is um, on the day I think anybody can be anybody. So the idea was, like I said to Angela, you know, if I lose, I'll take you out. Um, well, I never lost, <laughs> so <laughs> it turned out it was the, the, the last night um, we had a big party at my host family's house, and um, and, and she came round to that. So we had a we had a we had a really good night that night, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was just a, a really cool experience. I had to play uh, Ricky Fowler in the in the quarters and and Webb Simpson in the semis. Obviously, two pretty. Um, arguably two of the best players in the world at the time but um, yeah I just remember having a really good mindset that week my game was good no doubt about it I was playing some great golf but my mindset was brilliant um, I kind of believed on the first tee maybe bar one match I, I sort of stood in the first tee and I just felt that I was going to win uh, I, I felt that there was no reason why I shouldn't win Um and to kind of enjoy the challenge. And um, I think you'll hear a lot of guys, even this week, when they win, listen to their, their their winning sort of speech. And they won't talk about, you know, I got the club in a great position at the top and I flushed it. They'll talk about mindset all the time and confidence and um, being in a good place and being happy. And that was, that. those were all key things for me that week. Good. And I think, you know, as we go through talking about Augusta, we'll move to Augusta now, maybe, and Victoria can put up a, a, a good image of you at Augusta. Um, we'll talk about perhaps mindset and who might be in the best frame of mind going into going into this week. Um, so, yeah, here, we, here, here we've got a, a very youthful looking Richie at uh, Augusta National. I'm sure you all that, that, that waistline looks great. I haven't <laughs> seen that in a while. <laughs> so uh, that's brilliant. I'm particularly impressed with the carbon corporate colours there, Richie, as well. That was just showing great foresight. Um, <laughs> might have to get that one on the office on the office wall. So, um, so we're now at Augusta. What what makes Augusta so special? Um, there's there's few places. Well, there there actually is no place like it in the world. You know, Valderrama for me comes is the kind of European equivalent, I would say. Um, but Augusta is one of these places where just like everywhere you go, whether it be a football stadium or whether it be, um, you know, uh, like a really nice hotel, or whatever, you have an element of expectation. And um, with these with these places, um, the expectation is generally quite high. So to meet meet your expectations is a big task for wherever you're going. Um, and I was just like. Like, it wasn't even close to what I expected. It was just way better. Like, it was like a dreamland. Like, it literally was. Everything was, like, perfect. The people were so nice. The, you know, everywhere was manicured uh, exceptionally well. You know, like, all, all the flowers seemed to be in bloom at the right time. You know, the birds were chirping almost, like, on a clock the whole, way, whole time you were there. You know, um... Everybody's really respectful. Um, the patrons, as they call them, who walk around, um, and the facilities are just like everything's first class. Everything's done seamlessly. It's like every, nothing is a problem to them. From it sounds funny from picking up, you know, a car at the start of the week, um, which you get, you know, you get a Mercedes to drive around, um, and. You know, the range has changed since I've been there and I, I heard that the practice, practice facilities are even better. Um, you know, anything you want, you know, it's not just like one ball in the range. They've got every single ball you could ever imagine in the range. So you get to practice with the ball you want 
um, all the time. Um, and that sounds like a very small detail, but if you imagine if you have, you know, 30 different types of balls and you're hitting on the range, someone needs to sort that out by hand and get them back to you. Um, and that was, that was never a problem. Um, and it was just, it's just such a beautiful place. It's like, you kind of, you just, there's a few places in, in Scotland, maybe like Loch Lomond, where sometimes you just stop. And you're just like, you just got taken. It's just, your senses are just hit, whether it be like, let's say the birds, just the, the view, like how, how it fe everything feels so nice. You know, the grass all seems like a perfect color. You know, there's a light bit of dew and everything. Like say the flowers are in bloom. Um, and the golf course is just like a dream to play. It's one of those courses that you can come off and it can absolutely beat you up. And you get off the course and you're like, I just want to do that again. Even though there's not many courses like it, even though it could really mess with you mentally, which it did a little bit with me. Um, it's just an unbelievable place. One of the few places in the world that if you ever get the chance to go, you you need to take the opportunity because it's almost a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. No, you, you've, you've painted a, a beautiful picture of Augusta there, Richie. And I think it's, it's a proper bucket list uh, item. It's one of those things that yeah. we all would, would would love to do. I saw on Twitter earlier uh, Bob McIntyre posting, the Tuchters have arrived as, <laughs> uh, as he drove down Magnolia Lane. Uh, did you feel like a Tuchter when you drove down Magnolia Lane? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was, I was, you know, a little bit rabbit in the headlights. Um, the, one, the one thing I did do, uh, which was one of the, the best things was that you're allowed to go there prior to playing the tournament. So my first actually drive down Magnolia Lane was in, I think it was November or maybe early December the year before. And I went there for, I think it was four days and literally spent every day on the golf course. And I would, and the idea behind this was like to take the wow factor out because there's, you're, you're taking in so much you're almost not really focusing on what you're doing. You're, you're kind of like, what? You're looking around, you're, you know, your jaw's on the floor. Um, and it's very hard to focus on the job at hand. So I went there for four days with my coach and we mapped out everything. Um, and it was brilliant because then I knew where everything was. Uh, I felt a little bit more at home, but that those first two, three days, just absolute kid in a candy store. Just like, have you seen this? Have you seen what this is? You know, you know, you walk into the locker room and 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 you're just looking at some of the names and and then you're they've got a in the men's grill, which is really cool, they have a, a club from each champion. And over the last you know 20 years technology has changed dramatically. So you got to see like the Tiger Woods driver, and the Tiger Woods driver is the size of a rescue. It's absolutely tiny that he used when he won in 97. Um, and all these little kind of, all the little notes um, and the, the, the memorabilia around the clubhouse is brilliant. You just, you need a couple hours just to walk around there and just see things. Um, and, and that for me was key. It took the wow factor out and allowed me to, to focus a little bit more on the tournament. And when you arrive, you know, Masters Week, you know, what happens? Who do you meet? Um, you know, golf clubs are normally pretty heavy on rules. Are there any particular quirks of Augusta? Um, you can't run anywhere. Cannot run anywhere. Even if you need the toilet, like, you can't run. Someone will say, like, you have to walk. So there's no running. Um... They were very keen on me not to wear anything with a logo on it. I had to be very clean, and that and and because I was an amateur, I couldn't be seen to be wearing anything that wasn't endorsing anybody. Um, the 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 practice the practice rounds were the big thing, you know, trying to get a practice round with guys and speak to guys who'd played there before, and uh, I spoke to Sandy Lyle. Um, I got to play with Ola Thabo and Jimenez, which was was really cool, especially Ola Thabo. And watching him play the course, he he just was 
especially the short game was unbelievable around the, around the greens. Um, but yeah, they, they kind of, when you're a player, you, you, you kind of get the run of the place. Um, and you're, you're almost inside a bubble. It, it's only when you get out onto, which I would say the, the first tee, uh, and that's when you really start to kind of feel it because it's very, because I was in a marquee group with Mickelson and, and Adam Scott, it was very, uh, very busy and it felt, a bit of a shock to the system when I when I walked to the first tee, and uh, I think I think you might have won ten dollars off Mickelson, did you? Which not many people take money off Mickelson. You want to tell yeah. us about that? I think there's a a picture of that Victoria, maybe. Yeah, I was um, I I was really really lucky. I just literally right place, right time. Um, so I was there on the Saturday beforehand. And the idea was to play quite a few games and get a feel for the course and then maybe have a day off on the on the Monday or Tuesday. And we were there on the Saturday and Mickelson was coming up nine. And I was chatting to one of the members and he, this member, knew Phil. And it was, he said, listen, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let know let let Phil know you're here and you're I know you're playing with him and just to sort of settle everything down. And I was just like, Yeah, okay, that's great. <laughs> Don't know what to say. And then he comes up and he couldn't have been nicer. Um, you know, sort of congratulated me and saying when the US amateur. Um and I was kind of like, right, you'll say hi. I'll see you on Thursday. That's it. Right. And he said, and we are just away to walk away. And he said, oh, are you playing tomorrow? I said, yeah. He says, what are you doing in the morning? And I says, I'm probably just going to practice. He says, do you want to have breakfast in the champion's locker room? And I was like, uh, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> um, and then he said, well, 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 come in and have breakfast and we'll, we'll, we'll go and play the back nine. So I was like, didn't sleep much because I was like adrenaline and just like buzzing. Anyway, I got there and he's like, I was sort of, am I allowed to come in? Because you, if you only a champion can walk in that locker room unless you're invited with someone. So we sat there, myself, Mickelson, um, I think Rick Smith was there as coach at the time, Dave Peltz. And, um, just had breakfast and I just thought, right, like, I'm just going to ask him every single question under the sun. So I just started asking him questions and he was brilliant. Give him, give him a question. He would run through it meticulously, give you the, the full answer about Augusta. Um, and then anyway, we go on and we, we play a back nine, nine hole match for, for $10. So I'm like, oh God, don't get, you know, don't get thrashed. Um, Because I was obviously quite intimidated. Um, But then we start playing and we're, you know, I'm doing all right. Um, And I kind of, we get to 15 and I make birdie to go two up. So I'm two up with with three to go. And I'm kind of like, right, just make a couple of pars, like get half and it will be okay. So we stand on 16. And uh, I hit one in there and the pin's front left. And anybody knows you land the ball on the right and it it works its way all the way down the slope into the hole and I hit the shot on and I'm like put the club in the bag I'm like 12 feet and I'm two up so I've got a good chance for a birdie I can't remember what I said I said something something on the lines of because we're just he was throwing a bit of banter back and forth I said you know what Phil you can you know cash our checks fine and uh, of course big mistake he stands up, hits his, hits, I think, seven iron. It's over the pond, like halfway over the pond. So it's it's 50 yards off the tee. He, he, he said, well, that's good, straight away. And I'm like, okay. So the, see the ball land, it stops, and then it starts trickling, trickling, rolls past my ball, in. And I'm like, oh no, why did I say anything? <laughs> what a rookie move this was. 
So then suddenly I've gone from being two up with a good birdie opportunity thinking I could close the match out to, to go in one up with two to play, but obviously the momentum's gone exactly the wrong way. Um, he birdies 17 and I'm like, oh no, right. I just hold it together and I hit it right off 18. It hits a tree and drops down and I'm like, oh, he rips one up the fairway and he's got like eight iron in and I, I've got a hack out because you can't cut it around the trees. And he hits one, it goes in the top tier and the pins in the bottom tier. And Envy knows Augusta Greens are absolutely lightning quick. Um, and I hit, I've hit a nine iron from a third shot. I've got 10 feet. Um, he rolls it down to about six feet. I box mine from 10 feet and he misses from six feet and I win the $10. And I've never been half a hurt about taking money off anybody in my life. Um, and that was that was a really cool moment. And he was he was brilliant about it. Um, just really open, uh, ask any questions. And he gave me a little a couple of wee lessons after we had lunch. And um, and, and as good as it was to play in the Masters. No, it's just I like him. Mean, it's just the taking this guy who's amateur champion and with. I think I think Victoria, are you able to put mute on, or can people just make sure they're mute? We're getting a conversation in the background. Crack on, Richie. Um, yeah, as good as the Masters was to play in, and and it was like a, an honour to be there, and I loved it. Like that was one of the abiding memories of my golf career. Like it stood out like a sore thumb because it was just you can't recreate that. Um, and and he was brilliant during the two rounds. Um, you know, I was playing really solid. Everything was going well, and I kind of made a couple of mistakes. And he stand on the tee and he said, "Come on, like you know, let's crack on. We need to make some birdies and little things like that." You know, when you're an amateur, it's you know, you're looking round and you're like, you know, I think he said on thirteen tee, you're looking round and like, right. Let's do something here. So um, he was brilliant and really put me at ease, and that that helped me during the week. Um, but the, the time he took out of his schedule to play, invite me to the locker room was exceptional, and that's something that I'll never forget. I'm very grateful to him for that. That's very impressive, Richie. You mentioned the greens. I was going to ask you about the specific challenges that Augusta presents, and I guess the greens are one of them. Yeah, so... Experience is key around Augusta. Um, it's kind of like playing your home course is that when you hit a ball in a green, particularly where the pins are very traditional, you know the breaks automatically. And, and the greens are difficult for three reasons. One, there's huge amounts of slope on them. Slope that you just cannot comprehend. Um, in parts, they're a little bit like uh, continental courses where you get our new courses where you get a lot of slope. Um, but add speed into that and it becomes a real challenge. So the, the slope and the speed are the two things. And the third thing is really the fact that when you putt, you always have to know where the 12th green is because the 12th green is roughly the lowest point on the golf course and everything moves to the 12th green and an example of this is when i when, even before i played a hole this was explained to me and i thought to myself yeah okay it runs down there but it can't affect it that much and on the first hole i had a putt in my practice round and it was about 20 feet straight up the green. Now, as I was putting, directly to my left-hand side would have been the 12th green way off in the distance. And I read the putt, clear as, can day, uh, clear as day, it's inside right with a fraction of break. And we both agreed. And I hit the putt and it broke like crazy about three cups right to left. And the caddy straight away was like, that's, that's the, the 12th pulling it. 
So you always have to know where 12 is. And any putt that's in the direction of 12 will be really, really quick. Um, and similarly, right to left, left to right. And there's certain pins that you really need to know where people leave what, what they talk about is good looks. So on, for example, on 13, there's a back right flag. And Evdy would leave the ball below the hole. And Ray's Creek would be on your right-hand side. So you'd think, well, the water will slope off left to right and the putt will slope off left to right. And I remember when we played with Mickelson, he said, go and hit this putt and read it for me. And I said, okay, it's left. It's maybe it's maybe outside the left. Um, I, think, I don't know if we have 13 up there, but um, that's 12 there. It was outside outside the left and it stayed left. Um, so it's uh, so it's, it's something you just have, that's why guys w who win there have a lot of experience. That's one of the key factors because that just, it shaves a shot here or there um, and that makes a huge difference. And we've got, uh, we've, we've got a question from uh, Mark Little who's, who's at, apparently Bryson's talking about um, r ripping his tee shot over one of the trees on the right hand side of the first is that doable? Would you have attempted that? Um, well, the bunker on the the bunker on the right hand side is about three twenty to carry, so you can hit it right there. But there's out of bounds straight right, so you could hit it. But it's one of those things that for a first tee shot, if you just miss it, it's gone. Um, so. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a real fan of the whole the way things have developed with the technology. I think it over, it takes the strategy and the and the, the thinking out of the game. But I believe that Augusta is firm and fast, and that will be better for what I would say is the thinkers, the people who are more strategic, the people who have slightly better short games because it's hard to get up and down when the greens are firm, and have better distance control because if you imagine just like when we play a Lynx golf that firms up if you just miss it by a fraction then the, fir the, the, the firmness and the, and the speed exaggerates any miss and it becomes becomes a lot harder to judge your shots into greens or um, you know hold fairways when you're hitting it over corners. And you know while we're on Bryson I suppose who 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 is the course going to suit this week or who's who's arriving in the with the right mindset who should we be watching do you think um i think yeah i think there's past experience is a, is, a, is a big leader so if you if you look on guys who have finished top 10 there and and they get a feel for the course that's a, that's a big um that's a bend indicator so I would say the, the keys for me are experience, form, and probably attitude. So like I say, being in a good place. Um, you know, John Ram just having a baby. He's a young player, but he has good experience around Augusta. Um, a very good short game. Um, can be aggressive when he wants. Um, he should be in a really good place. Obviously, he played well at the WGC, but he's had some time off. Then you've got Spieth, obviously fantastic record around Augusta, trending really well, but can you win two weeks in a row? That's a tough ask because it, it kind of, you know, mentally that's, that's tough to ask from, from any player. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got Rory. You know, the first round for Rory is absolute key. If he needs, he, he tends to get behind the, um, he tends to get behind the leaders quite early and he has to come from position behind. So his first round is going to be really key this week. Um, and then you've got, you know, Justin Thomas, one of the players, he seems to have improved every year and that course should suit him, hits it long because distance is a factor around Augusta, especially um, with the par fives. The par fives are really key to scoring. Enemy wins will have played the par fives really well. Um, and then there's a host of kind of, what I would say are sleepers 
guys who have done well in the past and have some reason to do well at Augusta, for instance, you know, Casey has played there numerous times. He's always seems to do well around there. Um, I would say Brian Harmon, he's a lefty, which gives you advantage to the left-handers because there's a lot of holes where you need to hit. For a right-hander, it's a draw, but it's easier to cut the ball. Um, he's an aggressive player, grew up in, lives in Georgia, went to uh, University of Georgia. And then someone like, you know, a Patrick Cantley, which he's coming on to a lot of form. Um, so th th there's a lot of players. It's very open, but I think experience is key around there. The guy, it's not often you get guys who win there with, with less than probably five Masters tournaments underneath their belt. You've not mentioned Westy. Yeah. I, I think he can do well. I just think, I almost think he's peaked a little bit too early. You know, nearly won Bay Hill. Um, nearly won at the players. Um, I, I just think it's a, a little bit too much to ask. But if it's firmer and faster, the ball strikers will come to the top. So it won't be the guys who just just about putting. The ball striking will be an important aspect. So if you look at guys who have got really good tee to green stats, like uh, you know Adam Scott's a good example. You know, flies under the radar all the time. Um, ball striking is very, very good. Um, and obviously has the experience there. No pressure because he's won there before. Uh, so a, a big thing for him. Okay. And, you know, well, how big a miss is Tiger going to be this year? I think we've got a picture of you playing with Tiger, not at Augusta, but at the US Open at Oakmont. But um, clearly he's a, a factor. What do you think? Yeah, he's he's still the biggest pool in the game, uh, by far and away the biggest pool in the game. Um, obviously, it's it's with his experience around there. It's one of those, one of these places where even if he wasn't on any form, he would go there and you would fancy his chances. And if he's going to win another major, I don't know about his 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 current sort of health but if he was to win another major Augusta would be the place because he feels comfortable there he knows all the breaks he doesn't need to do too much work um, and he's it suits his game his misses off the tee his strengths are approach play which you need to put it in the right spot into the greens and then putting he's a great putter so the course actually matches up with his strengths and it matches into his weaknesses, which are, you know, a bit of space off the tee. And everybody knows if he's going to have a bad part of his game, it's likely to be his driving. So he'll be a, he'll be a big miss, but um, there's a, a lot of young guns these days. And, and they all together as a collective provide um, a sort of a good level of entertainment and openness to the tournament, I would say, because it is very open. And after Tiger uh, momentous win in '97, uh, um, I think he said uh, the, the Augusta then tried to Tiger proof the course. That's quite interesting. What happened after that? Yeah. So the um, you have the the distance debate is is obviously pretty heated at the moment. Um, Augusta decided that they would protect the course with distance. Um, and uh, I was listening to a, a good podcast this morning with uh, with Mark O'Meara, and, and he was talking about a conversation he had with the then chairman Hootie Johnston, and uh, you know they introduced a, a new cut of rough, which was good for Tiger because it slowed down the course. New tees, which made it even longer, and he was one of the longest players, um, uh, at probably probably the longest player in the game at the time, and. You know, Amira was, was talking to the chairman and said, you know, you're putting back tees. It's, a, it's going to be a completely different golf course than when he won. Um, and he said, I think you should make the course firmer and faster and take away the rough. So that when the ball lands, instead of slowing down the semi-rough, it'll fire through into the pine straw. And that's where the problems start to occur. Um, and Mr. Johnson didn't agree with this. 
and he said he turned around and asked Tiger, he says, you know, Tiger, what, what do you think of the changes? And Tiger's like, oh, I love them. Love them. Make the course longer because it suited him. It played into his hands. So the, the Tiger proofing um, was actually or is actually one of the things that um, is a complete myth. It, it actually played into his hands more and, and gave him a better chance of winning because it took a lot of the guys, some of the shorter hitters, particularly if there was thunderstorms and the course started to play wet, it took them uh, more out of the game. They had, to, they had to really be at an ultimate, ultimate premium on their drive and their short irons and, and their, their uh, short game to, to compete, whereas he had the length and it, it made a huge difference. And we can't talk about Tiger without uh, asking you what it's like to be standing on the first tee, uh, waiting for Tiger and his entourage to appear and uh, how that feels. Um, quite quite nerve-wracking. Um, anybody that's ever played with Tiger, I'll tell you, he never arrives first on the tee. Never. Doesn't matter whether it's literally a minute to go or 30 seconds to go. He's always the last person on the tee. And um, it's just like a wave of... When I played, it was a wave of people. And you didn't see him. It was just like a kind of... A surge of people came forward to the tee. And, and before he came up, there was, you know, there's 15, 20, 25 people cameras everywhere and you're just like what is going on suddenly it's just turned into um mayhem from being nice and quiet and um yeah they, they talk about when tiger shakes your hand and looks at you he doesn't look at you he looks through you because it's like you know blinkers on he's got one thing to do and that's the win um and a lot of people can criticize him for that but once you see the circus that is around them, it must be incredibly draining to, to, to have to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, because if he stops for one person, he has to stop for 200 people. So um, so the circus that follows him is, in, is incredible. And I think that probably, if anything, helps him because that's his day-to-day. -day. That's what he's used to. Whereas... You know, it kind of throws you for the first few holes because you're because anytime he moves, everybody else moves. So you're over a shot, and he's he's not moving, but the camera people are moving around to get the shot for him on the, on on the putting green, and maybe you're trying to chip, and they're just all focused on him. Um, so it's quite incredible. I remember playing the eighth hole Oakmont, and it's about 230, 240 yards. And it was just three or four deep, the whole way around the hole. And I remember looking to the left and I was thinking to myself, I looked left and there was nobody over to the left, which is like hole six and hole four. And I thought to myself, well, we're not the last pairing out. And I looked over and there were people playing over in the corner, but there was nobody there. Absolutely nobody there. It was like everybody was just focused on our hole. Um, and it was like, it just felt like it was, you, you were in a constant amphitheater of people, which was brilliant. Um, it was just, uh, it's just quite daunting and it takes a while to get used to. Is there anybody else on the tour that uh, is intimidating to, to play with or challenging to play with? Um, Ernie can be quite intimidating, but that's because he's, he is Ernie Els, but he's huge. He's just massive. You know, he's just, he's, you know, six foot four and he's got that long, you know, for every three strides I take, it takes him one. And, uh, you know, he's got these, these huge hands, you know, you, you just think, you know, shake your hand, but am I getting it back? And, uh, and uh, he, he's just, physically, he's intimidating. Um, but none of, none of the other guys that I've really played with are are that way um they're all they're all pretty they're focused on what they're doing but um i, I was n i would never i've never played with nbl else like tiger it's like a different it's like an aura i don't know how to describe it it's there's, there's only a few people and i'd imagine you know maybe 
someone like Muhammad Ali or Maradona or Pele or something that you could compare him to. Um, and he really is the first like global golf superstar where people know if you say Tiger and they don't play golf, they probably know who, you, who it is. And uh, I don't think this will be ty Tiger, but who's, who's the joker of the locker room? Um, Mickelson is quite funny. Um, he's, he always seems to be la he always seems to be joking. You don't know if he's he's BSing or not. Uh, he told a little bit of a story the other day on the on the, on the Masters, um, but he's he's very uh, you know he's got that kind of wry wry smile. You know, you'll say something and you're just like, are you are you being serious or are you joking? Um, so I think Mickelson's Mickelson's quite funny, and if you give him if you give him a stick, he'll give you it back straight away, which is I like that's quite entertaining. I was at the Scottish Open one time, and uh, when you were playing, Stenson seemed to be uh, like enjoy a bit of a laugh, does he? Yeah, he, he he doesn't take himself too seriously. He's very dry, very dry sort of sense of humour, almost almost British, um, and he he's. You know, he, he when he when he's had a bad shot, don't say I wouldn't say anything, you know, because he, he can he's a big guy as well, six or six four, he kinda looks like a bouncer. Um but he if you see him just around the around the the clubhouse, he's he's kind of he's laughing and joking and he's he's he doesn't take himself seriously at all. Thank you, Richie. Um that's us at 7.45. I've got quite a few um, guest questions. So, right. you know, that's been a fascinating insight so far, but I'm sure there's, there's, um, there, there's more to come. Um, so on, you know, if anybody's got any questions, please use the chat function. We've, I think so far we've answered them as they've cropped up, but if you have any more, keep, keep asking. Um, so the, we've got, I think you've probably answered um, what you think of the impact Bryson DeChambeau is having on the game I don't know if you've got anything to add Gordon Cairns was keen to know about that um, it's unbelievably impressive what he's done and, and so, so I'll give you an example I was at the range today and I've moved my ball speed up quite a bit by doing some speed drills and everything um, and I've moved my my top level of speed by about seven miles an hour. Now that's a lot for me, like serious amount. Um, and seven miles an hour, for every mile an hour, you get probably two and a half yards carry in the air. And this is when I really like everything, give everything and don't care where it's going. Um, but Bryson's gone from hitting it on the carry 300 to flying it, you know, 335 and, and keeping it straight. And that's incredible to do that. Um, and he's got to be praised for it because he's kind of set himself a goal and and changed his body type and changed the, everything he's done with equipment. And, and it's very, very impressive. What I don't agree with is that he's been given the opportunity to do it. So I believe that the RNA and the USGA have missed the boat. So he can only do this because the club is so big and speed is the dominant factor. He should, in my view, the skill is, yes, having the speed, but on a smaller headed driver in order to hit it off the middle all the time. Because Omira said a really clever thing today. The way you challenge professional golfers is to make them think and to challenge them mentally. And if you're standing there with a big-headed driver and you know you can swing it as hard as you can, and even if you miss it, the ball will go within a 10-yard dispersion um, distance-wise, and it won't go off in, at tangents at right angles, you can kind of wail on the driver. Whereas if you have one of these older-headed drivers, which I grew up with, almost an wood, actual wooden driver with the screws in it, if you miss that driver, you know the ball is going off at a right, right angle. And that, if you play with that in your head, every knows, doesn't matter whether you're 
off 36, 10 or a professional golfer. If you stand the first tee with the driver and you carve one way right and you stand up on that second tee, it's in your head. You're thinking, oh, I'm not hitting this one right as well. And, and those smaller headed drivers uh, focus a lot more on technique and getting the club on your impact zone. So I would say what he's done is really good, but I feel that some form of not rollback, but reining in the equipment is, is, uh, is going to happen. It's great that you think a miss is like uh, 10 yards. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you've just put that carving it right thought in my head, so I'm glad I'm not playing tomorrow. <laughs> um, so Jerry Crines is asking uh, what, what advice you might give to Bob McIntyre. It's probably also interesting to know what you think his chances might be. Um, I think he's got enough experience. I think the... Uh, I think the big thing is the yeah if he can get over that wow factor because obviously it's the first time he's he's been there and played and he's got to put that in his rear view mirror and realize you know like I'm there to do a job this is a brilliant place to play and and um and realize that set is his goals pretty high because I think he's got a good game to do to do well around there he shapes the ball well. Being a lefty is a big advantage for him because, like I say, there is certain holes where you have, to, for a right-hander, you have to hit it right to left. Um, for example, two, three is an advantage, hit it right to left. Five is an advantage, hit it right to left. Eight is an advantage, hit it right to left. Nine, ten, um, thirteen, fourteen. Um, the only one that it's not is eighteen. That's really the only hole on the course so if you're a lefty it's a lot easier to control a little baby fade than it is to control a baby draw for a, for a righty and that makes a difference and um, that will help him and I think he's just got to set his, his, his goals high and remember yes this is great to be at Augusta this is brilliant but I'm here to like get a job done um, so 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 take that wow factor out of it. And David Romilly is asking, what can we do in Scotland to produce more world-class golfers? Um, it's a good question. I think um, Scottish golf's in the, in the middle of a transition. I think the, the idea is that you have a pyramid base. So you have the wider your base, so the more grassroots you have to choose from. You can pick kids and they can move up a pyramid when you get to the elite level. If I was honest, they need to think more about the future. And, and, and if you want to get people who are successful on tour, there's prerequisites to that. So there's things you need to be good at on tour. So distance is a big thing these days mindset and short game so so i'll give you a, a little bit of an example of of this so everybody knows that putting is really key um like putting is, is is a huge part of the game and it separates this week there'll be a lot of people who will strike the ball tee to green the same the separation will come on the greens in scotland we have numerous driving ranges but for a national setup, we don't have an indoor putting green. Now, you can, people can tell me as much as they want that their greens are good and you can come practice here, but you don't have a consistent place where they can putt indoor and putt on greens that would be the same speed as the tour and practice on slopes that would be the same speed as the tour. And that hasn't changed since I was a junior, since I was 14. So that's, you know, over 20 years. So for me, you know, there's a lot of things that have been done, but they haven't been, the money hasn't been allocated in the right way. Um, yes, you have to grow the grassroots game and you have to get those, those people involved. And just by participating, I think that's a great thing because golf has given me a chance to travel around the world, meet new people, um, 
you know, it, 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 I think it's a, a great sport, not just you don't have to be brilliant at it, but socially it's, it's fantastic. Um, but the facilities are not there in order to help the guys flourish. So I just think that funding is a, is a huge thing and having somebody at the top that they know what they're doing. Um, and so when you get the funding, allocate it properly. Um, it's just like a lot of things you see people who build stuff and it's not until afterwards you think, well, wh why did you do that? Well, that doesn't work. You know, as like, well, if you had someone who you knew what they were doing, you could allocate the funds properly and, and build a, a structure around Scotland that helps people, helps those people that are talented enough. Okay, Richie, before we get any more controversial, we'll maybe go um, to uh, preparation. We've got some uh, questions coming in on preparation. We've got um, Kerry, Kerry Faulkner, I think, is asking about, uh, you know, you're about to tee off in a, a major or something. Um, it's your, you know, what, what's your routine or preparation the night before? And we've also got Roderick Mayer saying, um, you know, pre-round routine. I love this question. Do you like to just hit a few to loosen up? Or do you prefer a full workout? <laughs> um, good questions on both. So, but before I play, I would say, obviously, go to bed, give myself plenty of time, you know, at least eight hours before I want to get up. Um, a lot of time bef before I go to bed, I would stretch, use a foam roller. Um, and I'll generally get up. If I have like a nine o'clock tee off time, I'll get up about three hours before. So I would like get up, you know, shower, I'll go back to the foam roller, um, have a bit of breakfast and I'll go to the, I'll go to the golf course or I'll go to the golf course, get breakfast. But about an hour 45 before that's when I really start. So I would do a warm up, which would consist of probably 25 minutes or going to the physio um so do a dynamic warm-up that'll be with bands or a foam roller make sure my body's loose um make sure it's activated and ready to go and then i'll do um putting uh, a little bit of chipping and then from about an hour before it's really long game i'll go back to the putting green and i'll get ready to go and um irrespective of where you're playing whether it be a monthly medal or you know your way to tee up at the masters your pre-shot routine should really be the same and if you find yourself slipping out of that you got to step back and start again and it generally you need a a small focus and it doesn't need to take too long so you need to have a focus on what you want to do so it's don't just stand up and go uh i'll pray that i hit the ball um you really need to have a, an idea of what you're going to do and and, and i generally have an idea of what shot I'm going to hit off the first, um, or or the target I'm going to hit at, and, and a good mindset with that. Okay, so I'm arranging my, uh, I think it's my turn to arrange my boys' golf trip next year. So I'm thinking yeah. uh, a dozen foam rollers, a couple of physios, um, keeping them out of the bar the night before, and, and that'll improve our performance. Is that that's what you're saying? Yeah, or you could. Or you could stay up late and have a lot of bacon rolls in the morning, and coffee, and just wing it. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe have a vote on it. <laughs> uh, Chris Cuthbert's asking, which is your favourite open venue, and are there any courses you would like to see added or, or might be added? Um, St Andrews is very special. Just, just such a cool place. Doesn't matter how many times I go there, just unbelievable place to play particularly in an open um i love muirfield as well muirfield is very special i think the design element of muirfield on the type of ground it is is incredible it plays so well whether you play it soft and slow or firm and fast um i really like royal burtdale royal burtdale's very underrated. I think the back nine there is just a joy to play through the dunes. That's a little bit to do about growing up at Royal Aberdeen. Um, there's not... 
term is not going to come back on. As long as Trump owns it, it won't come back on. I think there's there is scope for maybe another Irish course if they can have one at at Port Rush. They might think about having one at County Down. Um, because for two reasons. It is a cool golf course. It's something different. It has space. Infrastructure is tough. And they always get a full turnout. So they always get a huge turnout from the Irish fans. And they, they, they come there in droves. And um, and that's a big thing for, for atmosphere. And it's always cool to go somewhere which is a sellout. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's cool. I've got a, um, it seems like a, an interesting question from, I think it's Fraser Lyle. Uh, what separates a scratch golfer from a from a pro? Good question. Um, but there there were shots. Their worst shots are still recoverable. So you know, it's not how good your good shots are; it's how bad your bad shots are. I would say a scratch golfer, that's where there's a bad shot lurking in there, like a serious shot. Whereas a pro, whether it be with mindset or whether it be with technique, I think the the worst shot is, is less. And I think if they do hit it, they can recover quicker. Okay, you've talked a bit about mindset. We have a question from Richard Scott on your view of sports psychologists like uh, Bob Rotella. Um, do you have one? What do you think of them? What's the? Um, I think they're. I think they can be very useful. It's 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 totally up to the person. So some people, like, if you speak to Harrington, he would absolutely swear by using Rotella and say that you know, the impact on his golf was, was massive. Um, you know, speak to DJ, he would be like, no, I just see ball, hit ball, fine ball. You know, he's, he's, it's just all on the person. So there, there's definitely for, for the average golfer, I think it's a, it can be a huge help for the average member because they struggle with that. I see guys getting nervous about stuff even before they fit a shot. Um, and just to take your mind off it. So uh, having, if you took, you know, like if I had a 15 handicapper, I'm almost convinced I could take them, get them down to 10 or 11. And half of that improvement would be mindset. Um, it, it's that, that important, particularly for those that are just, just average golfers. Okay, Richie, thank you. That sounded like a promise. Uh, <laughs> um, we've got a question. I can't work miracles, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's charming. You did, help me. you did help me. Nobody will believe it with my short game the last time we were out. But um, yeah, uh, we'll work on that. Um, there's another question coming. I'm not sure who from, but what, what's your proudest moment and what's your current ambition in golf? Um, proudest moment was probably when I won in in Kranz because it was I, I led every day and 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 leading every day is way harder than sort of playing okay the first round and kind of being in the mix and here there and everywhere and it was against a strong field and I was playing with Paul Laurie in, and Danny Willett in the final, I think the final group. Um, and obviously when I was 15, grew up, grew up you know, Paul won the Open. Um, so someone that, you know, you, you, you look up to, you, you, you know, you're kind of, um, I wouldn't say in awe, of, but, you know, he's accomplished an incredible amount in the game. And to go out and play the way I played and the mindset that I played and considering what I've been through the last sort of four days, you know, cause you've got to sleep on the lead. That's very underrated. Like sleep, like your mind is racing every night. Oh, what if I win this? Like, oh, 
you know, so, and you've got to kind of, everything is telling you, like, think about what, what can happen. And then you've got to press the reset button and be like, right, we're in the moment here. Like, we need to focus on this moment. And I didn't let any kind of emotion get into it. I was like, and anybody who knows me knows I can get a little bit emotional. Um, generally Friday. And I didn't let any emotion. I was like, today, I'm not going to let emotion. I'm not going to let anybody see that I'm up or down or whatever. And I remember holding that last part and giving like a huge kind of roar fist pump because that was like it. And and that was like, that that was my proudest moment so far. Um, just because it was all the ingredients coming together and everything was telling you one thing and I fought against it every day to do the, do the, to the opposite. Tremendous. And ambitions? Um, yeah, ambitions are, are tough these days. Um, I've had a problem with that. I'll be honest. I've had a real problem. I kind of get, I get, I get stuck a little bit. When I was younger, I would set goals all the time and it was, nothing would step in my way. Like I was very stubborn, selfish, you know, a lot of things that are, are sometimes not great things. I'll be honest. Like I, I, I've done stuff that I, I kind of regret, but I feel that I need to do in order to be successful. Um, my ambition at the moment is probably to win at least one more time because ultimately I promised Olivia that I would win. <laughs> Every time I come back, she asks me if I have a trophy and I don't have one. Uh, so um, that would be a really cool thing to sort of celebrate with her. And, and, I, and I feel that I've got at least one more win in me. There's certain courses that suit me and I feel that my body's still in good shape. My mind's in a place where I feel quite content and technically I'm, I'm, I'm still, I still feel, feel good. I still feel in my games. When I get in the mix, I don't feed it at all. And that's what I like. My biggest problem is sometimes believing that on a Thursday morning when I tee up. That's the biggest challenge for me. It's interesting. I'd never recognised the connection between uh, pro golf and salmon fishing. It's just like me going out, you know, fishing, and I get asked when I get home if I caught anything, and it's like, well, no. Nobody, <laughs> nobody understands why you do it. <laughs> not even sure I do. Um, back to uh, uh, Augusta. We did say we would touch on the link between Augusta and Hazelhead and uh you know, the and the link is the, the course architect. Might be worth just talking a little bit about Alistair McKenzie's influence. Yeah, so after Jones won the, the 1930 Grand Slam, uh, he wanted Alistair McKenzie to design the golf course. Obviously, Hazelhead, uh, I think, was done, was done much later, but McKenzie was brought in to build the course. Um, and... The whole remit was really to build it on a similar idea to the old course. So the idea was to have no, not much rough to play firm and fast. And the width, because there was no rough, would help create the angles. So angles are huge are a huge deal in, uh, in the golf course. And um, this creates the problem for the golfer. So... For example, um, the, if, if, if Alison can bring up um, the 12th hole, I'll give you a little, a little idea of why its angles are so important. Um, particularly for a right-hander, for a lefty, it's a bit easier. But there, if you've got the diagram for number 12, um, the green sits at an angle to you as a golfer. And it doesn't matter whether you hit the ball 350 yards or you hit it uh, 290 yards. Uh, the 12th hole is one of the hardest holes on the golf course. And the front of the green is, I'll just look at my yardage break here, I've got it here. Um, 
Have we got the twelfth Victoria or Alison? You know the um, it's like the sketch. The images with four of them for different holes, and we're looking yeah. for twelve. It should say twelve at the bottom. I'll give the give the the people a little bit more a better idea. Yeah, so you got twelve there. So this is the this is my yardage book, and this gives you a little bit of an idea of of what the challenge is. So obviously, there's there's different yardages to different points to the green. You got front left. You got middle where there's a little nine that's just over the bunker, and you've got um, you got back right. And there'll be there'll probably be two pins on the left. There'll be a one in the middle, which is the narrowest point, um, and I believe that's only about nine yards long. If you pace from the back of the bunker, I mean, if you're in your living room and you pace nine yards, you realise nine yards is not that far. But for a right-hander, the problem is that you'll stand there and Mackenzie, on a lot of holes, but this is the best example, the obvious thing would be to hit it in the middle of the green. But when you stand there as a right-hander and you see that left pin, you think, well, I'll, you know, if I just turn it over, it'll be okay. But for obviously a right-hander, it's going to go long of the green into trouble. And the same idea is on the right-hand side that if, and you've seen it with numerous people, Fred Couples got really lucky, it hit the bank and stayed up. Spieth knocked it in the water. Um, I think Tiger took a nine there last year. But if the pin is on the right and you chase it, for a right-hander, if you don't commit to your shot and you pull it, you fly the green to that bat bunker, which is, you can get any kind of lie. And if you just push it slightly, the ball won't travel as far. It'll spin a little bit more. It'll hit the bank and it'll go in the water. So the challenge is mentally, as you're standing over that shot, um, and... You can just see by the angle it's drawn at. That's that's relative to the way the angle is, it, it, the angle on the green, um, is that it plays with your mind. And every person, I will guarantee, every person that will tee up this week in the Masters, will know that. Okay, I've just like I know the twelve's coming. It's coming, right? I just need to get through it. I just need to make three on it, because it's a hole that it can ruin your tournament. And it's a hundred, you can see there, even from a front tee, it's 125 yards to the front left. It's 137 to the back right. So it can play really, really short. But you add wind into there, which swirls around Amen Corner like crazy. Um, you add a tournament on the line, and then you add in the angle change which guys know that will hurt them if they miss the shot. And, and that's a great example of how uh, design can challenge players mentally. Um, and and that's, that's a good example. You have it on 13's the other one, obviously, um, going around, uh, going around uh, um, or talk about 15, because we have, if you go to 15, sorry, if you've got 15 off, I'll, uh, I'll talk about 15. 15 is a great example where Mickelson always said to me, if you're going to hit it, if you're going to go for that green, I don't mind hitting it long because I've got a great short game. I can get it up and down. But he said, if you lay up and you lay up on the right-hand side, you lay up on a maximum downslope with the grain of the grass into you and a green above you. And for a right-hander, that's not a good combination. Um, so the optimum place to lay up on 15 is actually the furthest point left because it's the flattest lie. This allows you an angle to get into, to hit straight up the green. So there's a, there's a, there's a slope there on the right-hand side that's about 13 on. They generally put a pin about 15 or 16 on. So I'll check my, if I check my, stroke saver, I should have pin positions for 15. So four pin positions for 15 are 21, five from the right, which is back right, seven on, four from the left, which is on the very corner, 14 on, five from the left, which is 
almost just below, just below that slope in the middle and 16 on five from the right, which is that one I talked about, which is three above that slope on the right. Now, if you're on the right-hand side of the fairway on a down slope into the grain for a right-hander, your natural shot would be to draw it. So to a right flag, you want to lay up on the left-hand side. So, so width of the fairways and angles become a massive issue. They, they may talk about that this, this week, is that you can be on the fairway, but you can be coming in from the totally the wrong side. So attacking a flag when you're on the right side of the fairway for the angle to the pin is key. And that's, again, that plays into the players. Um, it challenges them mentally. So if you lay up on the wrong side and you've got a wedge into a green and you're like, I'm not on the right side of the hole here. I've got a wedge. I should be aggressive to this flag. But then you know the penalty is going to be quite a lot if you miss it off a slopey lie. That's what challenges players. And that's why it's so difficult. That's why you'll see a lot of guys who will, will make a run and one hole just trip them up. And it's it's any hole out there because of the fact that there's water. If you just mis, misjudge something, it's it can be really, really challenging. So width and angles are important. Um, and the angle you come into the greens is definitely important, particularly when there's a lot of slope on it. Um, that can't be overestimated. That's where, when it's firm and fast, the thinkers come into it more. Um, that that will give you that maybe give you a little bit of an insight into those two holes, which are our card wreckers, no doubt about it. You can you can make a two on twelve, and you can make a three on fifteen, but you can make seven on twelve, and you could make a seven or eight on fifteen, and that's the that's the difference. Thank you, Richie. That was a great reminder of what a simple game golf is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a great example of uh, how Richie thinks about the game, just slightly differently from me, certainly. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end, and I'm conscious we haven't been able to ask all the all the questions because um, we've we've got an awful lot. So a couple more. It's maybe just worth worth picking up on uh, green maps because I don't think they allow them at Augusta. And what your thoughts are on the use of them more widely? I, I've used them. I don't believe they should be there. Reading a green is a skill. Um, and that's, this is a huge thing this week because DeChambeau is, uses green reading maps meticulously. He takes a lot of time with it and, he, and you're not allowed to use them at Augusta. And that will, that will be something that will be difficult for him to get used to. And it, it may take him a few years to get used to it and get used to the greens. Um, and not, not having that sort of, crutch there that he can use um, so that's something that will be harder for him I just I, I think they should just ban them they should just said no we're not doing it 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 slows down play as well that sort of thing um, so it's slow for play and I think it's a skill and any skill you should be able to learn and not just have it given to you and the, the, the final question I'm getting pushed uh, for a you know who's going to win um If I had a favourite, I would say probably at the moment Justin Thomas. Um, just because I believe his winning percentage is really, really high. When he's in the mix, he wins a lot. I think he's won 14 times or something since he's turned pro. Um, and he's improved every year. And he didn't play last week. So I feel like he won the players. He's well rested. He's played Augusta enough um, to learn it. And he has hit the ball a long way and has a lot of shots. A lot of shots. And then ultimately, he's a great putter, which generally only really good putters around Augusta win. 
Okay, thank you, Richie. Um, that's that time has flown by, and we've not been able to get through all the questions. So I'm sorry for uh, you, you know for those who haven't had their questions answered. Um, but hopefully, you've had an insight into Augusta and Richie's experiences and his uh, career and uh, what he is still keen to achieve. So um, I'm, I would just like to wind up by thanking you all for joining us. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to the next four days, and we'll be glued to the TV. And let's hope we're in for a a nail-biting uh, finish. We've got some comments coming in about uh, being brilliant. So thank you, Richie. There's some thanks coming in. That's really appreciated. Well, thanks, thanks very much for for everybody that's come on. I know it's um, it's a little bit different, but um, no, I appreciate you coming on. And listen, m my wife won't listen to me for five minutes, and you've listened to me for almost an hour and twenty. So <laughs> that's quite impressive. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah, I think you've been a great sport as always, Richie. Uh, and, and, you know, I really appreciate you giving us the 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 time. Um, and I think, you know, for any potential sponsors out there, I'm sure Richie would be interested in having a chat with you. That's always a, that's always a positive. And um, we've got, a, just from a carbon perspective, we've got a few more webinars coming. So look out for invitations for, we've got Mark Beaumont in May, Ailey Barber around the Euros in June. And uh, we're just trying to get a date confirmed for Jamie Murray around uh, Wimbledon. So we've got a few a few to come. So Richie, all the, all the best for the rest of the season. Uh, I'm sure we'll be following you and we'll see you see you again. Thanks very much. Hopefully I'll 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 uh, I'll have a trof trophy next time we speak. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And yeah, thank uh, you, Gordon. Good night to everyone. Thank you very much.